Hi, I'm Ed Foster. I uh, work at Nottingham Trent University alongside my colleague, uh, Rebecca. We're going to split this presentation into two. I'm going to talk for the first around 10 minutes or so, and then Becky's going to take over and make so much more sense. Um, this session is very much around our practice within our institution, looking at um, uh, an existing learning analytics system that we use for student success and raising the questions around what do we do in terms of making amendments to it and what considerations do we take into account. So this is very much a practice paper, this is very much focused on not just the mathematical modelling and considerations but actually also the organisational um, and, and uh, organizational considerations and change requirements that take place within it. So I'm going to talk for the first 10 minutes, I'm going to talk um, around context and background and Becky's going to talk in much more detail about the actual study itself. So NTU is a, by UK standards, fairly large university in the East Midlands region of the UK. Um, we were set up in the middle of the 19th century with a very strong vocational focus and that's remained through into our DNA now. In more recent years, the institution has become very focused on what in the UK we describe as, as a widening participation agenda. Um, it's the student success, it's this recognition that students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to get into university and less likely to succeed and therefore what can we do about it as an institution and learning analytics is part of our overall strategy in this area. Just for context as well, for those of you uh, not from the UK, most of our degrees are three years and um, some of our degrees um, where a student goes away on, on a year's placement after their second year of study will be four years long. Okay. The team we work for, the Student Engagement and Analytics team, is a combined team. We are very practitioner focused. We are responsible for delivering our learning analytics platform within the institution and making sure that it works in the need to meet the needs of both students and staff. But we also conduct research as part of what we do. We think that the two things need to be balanced. Um, the focus is very much on application of learning analytics, um, not just the experimentation and development of, of, of new ways and new approaches. So as I say, our, our, our strategy is number one, or our purpose is, first of all, delivering systems to support engagement and success. So um, with a very strong focus on student success and widening participation success, but also understanding what the barriers are to students engaging um, or how students engage, what the barriers are and what we can do about changing that. So a lot of our work is with academics who offer support to students, trying to work out how we do the best job of giving them data information and resources so that they can improve how they support students. Our vision for learning analytics is pretty straightforward. We're focused on student success. Our interest, as I say, is, is how do we help students stay? The measure that we tend to use is progression from one from the current year to the next year. And like I think most higher education systems, we are particularly interested in the progression of first year students. And we use as a secondary measure any grades that a student achieved. So to give us a kind of additional quality check. I need to stress from the start, we use engagement and not socioeconomic disadvantage. So we use that North American concept of engagement of the kind of time on task activities that students do relating to their learning outcomes. And obviously the flip side of that, the way that the institution offers support to them. But we do recognize of course that the more European and Australian work in this field really draws out some of the areas of issues around challenges associated with socioeconomic disadvantage. But we, what we've done is made a conscious decision that we will only focus on the activity a student does as part of any algorithm work that we do. We're not using or mixing in um, socioeconomic disadvantage. It is worth stating, however, that the students who are from those disadvantaged groups are far more likely to have what we would call low engagement. They're likely to be doing less, whether because of um, kind of um, economic barriers, the need to work, etc., or um, kind of intruder syndrome or all those kind of factors that seem to be affecting those groups. We'd love to be claiming to be the first in the UK to do learning analytics institutionally, but of course those lovely people at the Open University beat us to it. So we tend to say we're the first ones to share our data with students and we use a commercial company called Solution Paths Stream Tool. Just to help, there are three ways that we use the tool. The first is what we call student managed success. So giving students information so that they can make use of the resource for themselves. And um, we know that around 40% of our students use it and use it very regularly, at least once a fortnight. 
We also have what we call staff supported success, where we provide information to our tutors in particular and other professionals who offer support to students. And it's very much designed around individual staff using it with students to help them improve the way, uh, overcome problems and improve their learning. And then the more recent area of work that we do is taking data to bring about institution level interventions. So what we're doing at the moment are activities such as working within our academic schools to give them data to target communications at students or working across the whole of the institution, looking at particular groups of students and targeting support or new interventions or new activities that might be of interest and relevance to them. We're going to talk around our work um, based on a, a current Erasmus project that we're doing called the OFLA project, which stands for Onwards from Learning Analytics. So very much like the keynote um, presentation, what we're interested in not, is not so much the use of, not so much the technology behind learning analytics, but actually where do we go in terms of change? Where do we go in terms of actually how do we bring about change with students? So our project working with two of the partner institutions is focused on the three steps and of course the steps blend into one another but we start with the trigger the alert the early warning sign that says this is the metric that we will act upon this is the data point that we will start from the second step is the communication so how do we communicate to student what media do we use but also what tone do we use can we change the way that students respond to the communication based upon nudge theories or ideas along those lines and then the final stage is the action stage. And most of these actions tend to be a one-to-one -one type conversation between a tutor and a student, but that's that, the what happens, where does the discussion take place? What's the remedial action that helps a student to get back on track and overcome whatever obstacles they face? Of course, the reality is that whilst on paper, this is quite nicely spaced out, the, in, in the practice, often the communication stage and the action stage tend to overlap. We sometimes see students responding to the fact that they've been emailed, even if they never attend an actual meeting with their tutor. Um, just to reiterate, we see there being two users in the system, um, students themselves, um, who we, they can see all of the data that we have on them in the dashboard itself, uh, in their own dashboard. They can't see information about their peers apart from an average line of the students on their course. And the other group are staff members, particularly personal tutors, who can see both the metrics, the data that we have about students, but also alerts, which is the focus of this, this, this paper. Um, staff as change agents, just a few things to pick out. We spent quite a lot of time trying to talk to staff and understand how they actually use this resource with their students. And there's a whole range of ways that staff use this. Often what they'll do in a tutorial session is that they'll ask students questions like, well, how are you engaging with your course right now? And then they'll open up the dashboard and have a conversation around um, where, what, what the data is suggesting and showing. And that sometimes is slightly alarming because we think staff go, ha ha ha. And actually, but most of the time what we think goes on is that staff are using it in a kind of constructive, reflective way. It's used to make comparison between peers. Um, and also what we think we see back from students is sometimes just the realization that the tutors have some of this data causes students to think about and change their behaviors and, and you know, to up their behaviors slightly. We of course spend a lot of time working with staff, raising awareness about limitations of the data that's there. And we know that this, you know, we're very explicit with staff that we can only see so much. And you know, it should always be used as a starting point, never as something definitive. And it's used very extensively because it can be used to make referrals through to other professional services such as counselors or student support advisors. Um, and it's used with regards to um, helping in terms of kind of early warnings. So the dashboard itself um, works in the following ways. We draw data in from seven points. Um, so we use attendance, logins to our VLE, e-resources, etc. This information gets pushed into an algorithm. We also can show con some contextual information and we often show less than is available within the institution for fear of stereotyping and for fear of overwhelming staff. And there's a constant discussion and debate around where the right balance of showing that information is. Overnight, every student, um, or the, the, all the student data gets pushed through and is processed through the algorithm, and every student gets a enge daily engagement rating high, good, partial, low, and very low, the circles on the left-hand side. And it also generates an alert, um, which will, obviously is the focus of what Becky will talk about in a moment. Um, and then what we have is um, a health check. Um, we expect staff to use this in a number of ways, so offering up health checks, discussion, offering advice, making referrals, etc.
So just my final point before I pass on, or almost final point, sorry, is it's important to stress that in some respects, the tool that we use across the whole of the institution is perhaps less sophisticated than some of the papers that we've seen uh, presented at the conference. And it's very interesting to watch much more sophistication in terms of how people are using uh, learning analytics data. But what I want to stress is this, the tool itself is very, very good at spotting kind of students at risk of non-progression, the students of, of a risk of not, not doing as well. And perhaps it should be because we're using engagement, we're using staff or students participation in their courses or, the, or the, the, the proxies that we can see. So just reading across the graphics here, this is a view of student, average student engagement for the academic year 2017-18. This is first year student data. So what we've got are these five boxes showing average engagement. So very low, low, partial, good and high. If we start on the left hand side, what we can see is it's mostly pink. If your average engagement for the year was very low, you know, effectively doing almost, or you're doing very little work over the course of the year, 87% of those students did not progress from first to second year. Another 10% did with okay grades, and only 3% progressed with what in the UK would consider, or what students often consider to be good grades. And if you read across the graphs, you can see that um, the pattern is very clear. As students' average engagement goes up, their likelihood of both progressing and achieving the highest grades goes up. And of course, we'd expect to see this. This is average for the year. It shows the strongest connection. But even if we took data from the first term or the first few weeks of term, we see a similar broad pattern. So this is data that we expect staff to use in their ongoing discussions with students. But what we also have is information about the alerts. So just very briefly, before I pass over, the alerts are data that we provide to mostly to staff. We've done some experimentation providing alerts direct to students this year, where what we say is this is a high jeopardy alert where a student engages with none of the measures that we use in the dashboard. And effectively a way of saying to staff, look, you may know, you may be aware of why the student is engaged, isn't engaging, but it's very important right now that you engage with them, that you make contact and see what the issues are. The tool um, works in this way throughout the first and second terms of teaching, and it runs continuously through both of those terms. Now at this point, I'm gonna pass over to Becky, and it strikes me that I have absolutely no idea how to duck out. So I'm just gonna mute myself and stop video. Right. Uh, hi everybody. Um, as you can probably tell from the difference in background, I've just realized how, that's okay, that's probably better. Um, Ed and I are, are uh, presenting across two different locations in Nottingham. Ed's in charge of the slide changes, so if it's not very smooth, you'll have to, uh, to bear with us. Um, so Ed's given you the context, and now I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation talking about um, the considerations that, that we had in terms of whether or not we should amend our institutional learning system which had actually already been in place for a number of years. Um, so this opportunity arose due to developments by the external provider of our learning analytics, path, um, learning analytics resource solution pack, who we work closely with. The new alerting functionality they developed added much more flexibility around alerting parameters, including the selection of groups of students to alert and the criteria upon which they were alerted. Um, but before we made any changes to the system, we wanted to make sure that we were doing so in an evidence-informed manner and having thought through the consequences from an institutional perspective. Uh, this is a slide change, two slide changes. <laughs> it's already working really well. <laughs> and another one. Um, right, okay. Uh, so the first thing we did uh, was to review the current setup to understand why it had been configured in that way. So alerts at NTU can be sent to anyone who's a personal tutor across a range of different academic disciplines. And for that reason, they were designed to be easy to understand and act upon. The alerts are based on no measured activity whatsoever, as opposed to a small amount of activity, which means the, re the receiver doesn't meet, need to make a valid judgment about what is an appropriate level of activity. Um, the alerts are based on 14 days or two weeks of no engagement. Uh, that represents both a recognized period of time within society and also a considerable proportion of the years um, of the term, about 20%. Um, so alerts were standardized across the whole institution and because they were set at that scale, they had a number of filters to ensure that students weren't inappropriately generating alerts. For example, distance learners and students on year long external, external placements were excluded. The alerts were designed to be early warning signs to leave um, sufficient time to act to bring about change um, to student behavior. And they were also designed to be a real call to action for staff around 
students potentially really highly at risk of non-progression. Change. <laughs> Um, so we knew from our previous work that progression rates varied by year group, uh, with first year students less likely to progress than students in their second year. Uh, students in their final year, which is either their third or their fourth year, um, had the highest rates of progression in this case to achieving a qualification rather than to an next year's study. Um, the data here is shown for 2017-18, but um, we've seen the same trend across multiple academic <laughs> Analyzing the 14-day um, the no engagement alerts that were generated for between 5 to 8% of each year group, it's clear that whilst in all cases the alerts identified a group of students whose progression rates were significantly worse than their peers, the alerts were greater indicators of risk for non, of non progression for first year students, where only 22% of the alerted students progressed, and final year students, where 64% of the alerted students progressed. So this isn't surprising given the variation in overall progression rates shown on the previous slides, but it does mean that whilst the time frame of alerting was consistent across the year groups, the risk associated with generating the alert was not consistent. <laughs> we considered the potential advantages and disadvantages of changing alerts. The most obvious change was the new functionality allowed us to treat different groups of students differently. Um, which has advantages in that it allows us to tailor the alerting more to the groups, uh, potentially making the alerts more relevant to their context and hence more accurate. Um, also, shortening the alerts could lead to earlier warnings for certain groups, maximising the potential to act. And, um, and being able to set different parameters would give us greater control over the number of alerts that were generated. Um, however, we were really conscious that treating students differently has the potential to be seen as unfair by students and also adds a layer of complexity for staff. So just in terms of the methodology, in order to ascertain the relationship between yeah, um, the alerts of different lengths and progression, we used the daily engagement data from 2017-18. We calculated the days with no measured activity um, for each student and then calculated how many alerts of different lengths would have been generated for the student if that alerting length would have been in place during the year. So initially we tested 7, 10 or 14 day alerts. After the initial round of analysis, we also looked at 21 day alerts for final year students. Uh, multiple alerts could be generated per student uh, based on non-overlapping non periods of no activity. But in the following slides, we've combined the figures for students generating any number of alerts into one group of alerted students and compared them against students who, generate, who didn't generate any alert at all. Um, so here you can see the progression rates of students who would and would not have generated alerts of different lengths. The graph is plotted based on the number of students, not the percentages. So you can see both the number of students generating alerts and the relative proportion of progressing and non-progressing students. In all cases, alerts identified a group of students with lower rates of progression than the average for their year group. Um, if you look at a block of alerts for a specific year group, like first year students, um, which is a, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's evident that shorter timeframes of alerts resulted in a greater number of students generating alerts. So shorter alerts identified a greater number of non-progressing students, true positives, also a greater number of non-progressing non students, false positives. Um, so shorter time frames of alerts are less accurate indicators of non-progression than longer ones. Um, if you compare the same length of alert across different year groups, you can see that in each case, alerts are less severe indica indicators of risk of non-progression for final year students than second or first year students. Um, next, yeah. Um, so, for time purposes, we've only shown a subset of the analysis we conducted. Amongst other things, we also analysed the total number of alerts that would have been generated, bearing in mind that um, shorter alerts give the potential for more repeated alerts about individual students. Um, so, with all the data in front of us, we set about deciding what the alerting time frame should be. Uh, this raised a number of questions. Chief amongst them was, what is an appropriate level of risk upon which to generate an alert? 20% um, chance of non-progression, 40%, 80%. We thought the level of risk that felt appropriate was likely to vary by individual and also be based on how many students um, the alert identified as being at risk. So supporting 10 students with 40% chance of progression is clearly different from supporting 200 students with the same risk. Um, so you could argue that shorter alerting timeframes are better as they identify more at-risk students um, who could then be supported. 
but there are also implications of, um, of generating false positives. Um, these false positives provide extra demand on staff resources, and whilst those students may have benefited from the extra support, it takes focus away from students most in need. Also, false positives can erode trust in the system, meaning, um, meaning that tutors kind of ignore the alerts. Uh, importantly, false alerts may impact student stress and motivation and risk um, stigmatising students as well. So thinking specifically um, around the appropriate level of risk um, of alert should be generated, we settled on greater than 50% risk of non-progression. So 50% is a common reference point in today's society, uh, like guessing the outcome of a coin toss, uh, also represents a significantly higher risk of non-progression than the general student population. Um, so you can see from this table that close to uh, but over 50% of chance of non-progression could be achieved by selecting 10-day alerts for, fun for first year students, 14 days for second years and 21 days for final year students. Um, the tables on this slide compare standard 14-day alerts from, for all students with alert timeframes that vary by year group. So 10, 14 and 21 days for first, second and final years respectively. Uh, you can see that varying the length of the alerts results in about 250 more students generating alerts during the academic year than for standardised 14-day alerts. Also, you can see that the alerts of variable length have the same overall non-progression rates as 14 days, 57%. Um, but the non-progression rates for individuals, year groups during um, within that are very variable alerts are, are more consistent than for 14-day alerts. So we, um, we took the proposal to, to senior decision makers to keep alerts as indicators of high risk defined by greater than 50% chance of non-progression. We could keep alerts at 14 days for all students or could vary alerting length, um, alerting length by year. So this would mean shortening the alerting time scale for first year students and lengthening the time scale for final year students. Senior leaders felt comfortable shortening the time scale for first year students. So yes, more false uh, positives would be generated, but first year students are, um, are going through transition into higher education, were less likely to have developed strong support systems at university. So this extra support offering was felt to be appropriate. Um, it wasn't, however, seen as appropriate to lengthen the time scale for final year students, despite the reduced risk for that group, um, as it was felt that waiting three weeks before contacting any student who had shown known signs of activity uh, was not fulfilling the university's duty of care towards students particularly in the climate of increasing worry about student mental health. So for the 2019-20 year, um, alerting was set to 10 days for first year students and then 14 days for second and final year students. Um, so in this presentation, we've, um, we've tried to present some of the different factors that were considered when selecting the appropriate time frame for alerting from a practitioner's perspective. We haven't had time to go through everything, but hopefully hearing how we've considered the broader context in which the alerts were generated, the relationship to progression, and also the ethical implications of the different alerting length um, has been thought provoking for anyone who's considering implementing alerts in their own institutions. Um, we're conscious that whilst we work behind computer screens for the majority of the day, um, that, the, that our um, decisions really impact our colleagues across the institution, particularly in terms of the expectations upon them to react to alerts. Um, so we're also aware that there's many other important questions remaining around what should be done once an alert is generated to effectively bring about change. This is the focus of our ongoing research, um, part of our Erasmus Plus funded OFLA project, which we're working with, um, on with Artevelder University College and University Medical Centre Utrecht. Um, for more details on the outputs of the first year studies, you can see our project website, which is um, referenced on the slide. So uh, finally remains to say, thank you for listening and invite any questions.